finally the uh, the day came when we were allowed to go up the hills because it had been a couple of weeks. Everyone was anxious to get up and have a look what the uh, the mess had been as it made of the house by this fire. So we rocked up to Whittlesea, got in the line of all the cars, and the uh, coppers had a roadblock on the road. And uh, if you're if you're a resident, you'd been burnt out. You went around and you you uh, signed in at the sort of caravan that the coppers had there. And they put a, a wristband, like a thing you have in the hospital, where they clamp it around you so they can ID you or whatever. And I think Marilyn got that and stuck her arm, and off we went up to the hill. We went drove up through the through the mess, and um, I mean the, it was unreal driving up there because the, well, it was all devastated by the fire. It was all everything was black, totally different because you could sort of it was like an X-ray vision. Some of those, it looks as though the mountain that had its clothes taken off, so you could see that everything was on the ground that you couldn't see before, and all the big arches over the trees that were arched over the roads they were sort of gone. It was all. Everything was just clear, and um, even when we went around to Flowerdale, through the round through past um, King Lake and the store, everything was burnt out. Parts of the road were still they were still on fire. They're still burning, you know. Even a couple of weeks later, the branches and the stuff were still burning. Um, and you know, we went along, and there was this house was burnt, that house was burnt. And then when we got down to Hazeldean or Flowerdale, we turned off. The, the site was just unbelievable. It was like it was like a, a small version of a Hiroshima. You know? Everything was just flattened. The, the, the only thing was left was the roofs. They were, you, know, you see those pictures. And that's what it was like. You know? So then we drove around. Of course, we went across the bridge into our street, which is a kilometre from the main road. And every house in that street was buggered. You know, every house was burnt in the whole street. And the street was a kilometre long. Every one of them. Beautiful houses that we been inside that were absolutely beautiful. Took years to build. You know all gone, you know, every bloody one of them, apart from actually the original people's house on the corner. That was ironical, the original people that came, that uh, built there probably 40 years ago, their little, their, little, their little brick house was still there. But you know, everything was gone, I mean it was, it was just such an unreal feeling to see your whole street, not just your house, but your whole bloody street gone. Everything that you'd got used to going up and seeing all the time, you know, uh, it was just, you know, the stuff that was in your brain. You knew this house and you knew that house, you knew all your street. And all of a sudden it's just gone. It's just a pile of shit, you know? A pile of tin. And then of course we got to our own house. And of course we'd been expecting it. But you know, there we were. There's a big pile of green mud brick with a bell of green tin. At least the old colour bond was still green. And that's where we, uh, when I pulled up and started filming the, you know, got the camera on and, um, walked up the driveway and, and checked it all out. But of course, um, you never expect to see, you never expected to see it like that. But at least it was recognisable, I suppose. Some of those poor buggers, they just had a roof, they had nothing exactly, because everything burned. But at least our mud brick, we had a sort of, we could sort of look over the body, so to speak. The body wasn't totally disintegrated, we could recognise stuff. Which was good because, you know, you could walk through the place and see see what the hell had happened. But uh, that was the thing that sort of struck me as well as my own house where it had been totally devastated was this whole street. You know, it's, uh, you know, I can't emphasise it enough that you've never experienced anything until you see your whole bloody street, your whole suburb walk down. I mean, it never happens apart from bushfires or wars. Floods, it doesn't happen in floods because they recover. But this is just total devastation of everything you knew, you know, all your surroundings. And, uh, well, it was to take a deep breath and bloody, you know, absorb all that. And uh, after that, well, I just, uh, well, we just sort of let it sink in, you know. And to this day, I've sort of, you know, it's still, it's still, a, still a traumatic thing to, to talk about. Um, especially, you know, the lives were lost and the people you saw. And um, man, just just to miss the place, I suppose. It's um, yeah, it's one of those things. They say you can always rebuild a house, but in that in that in my circumstance, you couldn't have rebuilt that house because it took so long and it was so special. So once it was gone, it was gone forever. And um, well, sort of, I get sick of talking about it. But uh, you got to, I mean, I. You have to talk about it, but uh, I don't think anyone's listening, you know. And uh, to this day, there's there's a lot of trauma up there. 
A lot of people have killed themselves. A lot of people have been divorced. And the kids are still traumatised. The people are still traumatised. And um, on world scale, I was just talking to Carol about it. On, on a world scale, this is nothing. 178 people killed. Blah, blah, blah. You know, in, in Japan, there's 20,000 people wiped out. You know, how the hell do they survive? All that, you know. And then, then you, you, you do hear about them. They, they, they can't come back. And they're not being helped. I mean, we were helped tremendously by the people of Victoria. Um, and we were very grateful for that all over Australia. It was fantastic. And the help that we got. Of course, it's uh, it's all over now. It's you know people are sick of it. It's um, sick of hearing about it, I suppose. Uh, that's sort of probably like the old war veteran, like me, old pop. He never stopped talking about the First World War, you know. <laughs> and obviously, why now? Because it was um, the biggest bloody thing that had happened to him. And why nothing else sort of mattered, you know. Um, and uh, those guys, they really suffered. I mean, what we did was only happened over, say, over one day, and I wasn't even there. And it still affected me tremendously. So um, imagine what it was like for those guys in the First and the Second World War, that they went through five years of that. So you do have to keep things in perspective, but it's still in, in some, it still doesn't help, you know, even knowing that sort of stuff, even knowing other people's trauma. Because trauma's trauma, and it hits you. When we were sorting through the ruins, it didn't seem so bad. We were just sort of having a bit of a laugh about it all. When we, when you walked inside that building and you saw the the, um, <clears throat> the glass bricks in the passageway, it all melted like bloody candles down the side of the wall. <laughs> it was actually it was a bit of a laugh, really. But uh, we were just sort of astonished by that what heat can do, you know, what what actual heat can do to glass and steel and wood and even the mud bricks. You know, in some places were damaged, you know, which was pretty unbelievable. But we were grateful we had mud bricks because we had something left, you know, something left to have a look at. Whereas the other people there in, in um, Sewer Creek Road, around in Hazeldean, that had just little shack sort of places, all they had was a pile of tin. So, you know, being a two story house, to it sort of, the bottom story was sort of intact a little bit. Um, but, um, yeah. Yeah, bloody trauma, eh? I can, under I can understand trauma now. I can understand it really well. And you wouldn't want anybody to go through it. But it's a... Uh, yeah, it's... Um, well, I've found it even harder to get over than a death in the family, to tell you the truth. Deaths in the family seem to fade a bit more. But this sort of keeps with you. Um, I don't know why. Maybe it was such a big thing, a big deal with everybody else involved, I don't know. It was, it was also to see a whole a whole sort of street, a whole area just sort of killed off, you know. That was a, that was a hard part, but um, it was where you came, it was the, the place that I spent the most time in. And it was like, uh, it was like a part of your life had just sort of been disappeared, rubbed out where you were and where you liked and where you, you came from and where you expected to be and stay was gone. Never to come back. And um, that's what I found the hardest. There was no future. <laughs>